Hi, my name is Mark Birnott, and I'm getting a PhD in economics. This video is about hyperinflation. We're going to look if hyperinflation is a real scenario for the United States of America. I think I have a little bit of expertise in this area because my dissertation is actually on price level movements and more specifically the economic theorist Knut Fixell, 1898, and he wrote in the uh, latter 1800s, early 1900s about price level movements. Now the first thing we have to understand, we're going to define hyperinflation, we're going to look at some of the history behind it and look at the evidence because this is evidence based not opinion based. As the caveat is whenever you prognosticate it's very difficult to see the future but looking at the current data and the past data I think we can extrapolate a little bit and again it's not perfect but we can make a determination if hyperinflation in the United States is a real scenario. The first thing is what is hyperinflation? Hyperinflation is generally defined as inflation that is over 50% a month. It's very different than normal inflation. Normal inflation is a 2 to 3% increase in the price level, usually defined by the CPI or the PCE in the United States. And there are problems with those measures because they don't include asset price inflation or something like real estate price inflation. But given that, let's just look at the difference between inflation and hyperinflation. Inflation may go up to 5% and even 10% at a spike. However, hyperinflation is usually more connected with 1,000%, 50,000%, uh, a million percent. So you can see that hyperinflation is a little bit different than inflation and the causes are different. Under the theory of Vixel, and his pretty solid theory, which I subscribe to, is inflation is caused by a disequilibrium between the natural rate of interest and the bank rate of interest. Without getting into the de detail, we're going to put that theory aside. Because the causes of hyperinflation are something a little bit different. It's caused usually by a rapid increase in the money supply. If you know the quantity theory of money, the quantity theory of money started with Nicholas Copernicus. Yes, the Polish astronomer and mathematician. And I'm actually going to school for my PhD in Poland. Hume, David Hume developed it further. And then we have other people like Irving Fisher in the early 1900s. And probably most famously recently is Friedman Milton Friedman and Anna Swartz. They were proponents of the quantity theory of money. The quantity theory of money is MV equals PY. The money supply times the velocity of money equals the price level times the GDP. Now, the component that most people look at is the money supply, but they also forget about the velocity of money or even the growth in the economy. Most people just hold those things fairly constant and say if the money supply increases, the price level will increase when looking at normal inflation. But again, hyperinflation is not inflation. It's almost unrelated to some extent because inflation is caused by, again, the natural rate of interest versus the bank rate of interest. Whereas hyperinflation is caused by two primary reasons. A government consciously and doing it in an, a way that they understand will devalue their currency purposely. It's, it's in a way that is you can't imagine. It's not like expanding M1 or two, M2 beyond the target levels by a few percentages. It's printing billions and trillions of the currency in a relatively short time. And in order to do that, you basically have to get a printing press set up. The second reason is political instability, which leads people to lose 
faith in the econ in the economy and the currency. But I'm not talking about the normal Malthusian pessimism that might be prevalent in, you know, the popular press or sometimes with YouTube economists. I'm talking about collapse of uh, a nation. And an example would be Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was being broken apart and they experienced hyperinflation. Now, more typically, it's caused by just simply uh, central banks creating excess money supply. Examples of this are most notably the Weimar Republic after WW1. They needed to pay reparations. And the only way they knew they could do that is by monetizing that reparation payment. So they consciously chose to write billions and even trillions of DMARCs into, and put them into circulation. They chose it and everybody knew about it. You also have Zimbabwe's in, in the 2000s. You have Venezuela from 2010 till really today they have hyperinflation. Argentina in 1980s and then again uh, a few years ago they were experiencing it. Hungary 1946 the value of the currency there was uh, basically went to nothing. It was probably the most extreme case where every hour the prices doubled. You couldn't get paid fast enough. And again, in Weimar Republic, there was a comic going around that a, a little boy was sitting on a pile of cash and he was crying and somebody asked him what was the matter. And it was because somebody stole the cart that he was carrying his cash in. So you've got a lot of examples, but in each case, it was a government that definitively, consciously chose to devalue their currency and everybody was aware of it. Even in a non-transparent country, it became apparent very quickly. Let's take a look at the United States of America and the current situation. The current situation is the money supply, M1, has decreased from 20.6 trillion to 18.7 trillion. M2, a broader definition of money, has decreased 20, from 22 trillion to 20.7 trillion in the last, let's say, two years, year and a half. So we have both indices, both measures of total amount of money in circulation decreasing. That is not congruent with a hyperinflation scenario. What about the economy, the, the why part? The economy is growing. So you could even say that it's absorbing some of uh, any increase that would happen, actually. What about the velocity of money? Velocity of money has generally decreased since 1997, but there has been an uptick from 1.1 to 1.87 in the last couple of years, and that can partially offset this decrease in the money supply. Therefore, I don't see hyperinflation on the horizon. For hyperinflation, you would have to see a, let's say, a million-fold increase in, and that's a multiplicative increase in the money supply. And we are seeing a decrease in the money supply. It's also not going to happen because although the Federal Reserve is a semi-autonomous or autonomous organization in a transparent democracy like the United States, the political process would not allow hyperinflation to happen. Well, what about, people say, what about if foreign countries start dumping the US dollar for this fantasy of BRICS, okay? BRICS is a fantasy. It's not, it's, it's, it's not to be taken as a competitor for the dollar today. $950 million, almost a billion dollars, is the estimated currency holdings of foreign countries. If they dumped it, that's not a large uptick in the total amount of uh, money in circulation. If they dumped it and brought it to the United States, a trillion dollars relative to the $20 trillion 
but bring it up to 21 trillion and we're not even back to where we were. Okay, well, you say, what about the debt? The debt is at, the national debt is at $33 trillion. And I'm fairly, you know, fiscally restrained in my personal life and with gov government spending. However, you know, in, in relative terms, $33 trillion would probably double the price level overnight. If we just wrote a check, $33 trillion and paid off the debt. It, there are other, other issues with that, but it would probably double the t price level because if the monetary base is around, you know, 20 trillion and the debt is 33 trillion, you know, you do a simple back of the envelope calculation, that's about a little bit more than a double. And hyperinflation is a sustained, it's a sustained increase in the price level. So even if foreigners dumped every single penny of the US dollar, which is a scenario I don't likely see, and the US wrote a check for the 33 trillion in debt, the monetary base would probably only increase at a one-time blurb of 100, uh, 100 and, let's say 120%. But hyperinflation, inflation, we're talking about a sustained increase. A couple of years back, people were looking, look at the price of eggs, they're going up. This is hyperinflation. It's not hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is a sustained increase and a conscious devaluation of the currency. Eggs went from, I don't know, $2 to $4 to even $8 a dozen. I was in the market the other day. It was $1.20 a dozen. I even saw it at $1.09 a dozen. That's pretty cheap. And, you know, milk was two twenty nine. If you buy five dozen eggs, five gallons of milk, bread, meat, and grow your own vegetables, and maybe a few other things like oil, you're pretty well set. But under hyperinflation, I should see, I, I should go back to the market today and see the price of eggs $20 uh, a dozen, $30, $100 a dozen. So we do not have hyperinflation, nor do I see it coming in the United States. And I can say that with reasonable confidence, supported by the evidence that the money supply is not increasing at the rate that would support a hyperinflation scenario. Now, if something changed, we can revisit our idea. But based on past history, looking at the trend of the money supply and current data, it doesn't look like that would happen, uh, coupled with that we have a tr fairly transparent democracy and nobody would allow that to happen. There would, be, there would be a revision in the way, and there would be no reason for them to hyperinflate the currency. So we're not gonna have hyperinflation in the United States. I wanna give you a positive message because I believe economics is a hopeful science. I am not a Malthusian. There's a lot of Malthusians walking around out there. And you know, people tend to look to the example and fixate on the negative rather than looking at the data and the general picture and the general picture is, things are getting better. Now, you might also say, well, what about just normal inflation? Normal inflation, that's another topic. But at this point, I think, based on the interest rate increasing and the monetary base decreasing, it's fairly under control and the Federal Reserve has said that they're going to move back towards their target of two to three percent. As a monetary economist, I have a little bit of issues with the optimal growth trajectory and its relation to inflation. And I'll give you that point because I study Knut Vicksell and I do believe we don't are not on a uh, money macro equilibrium optimal trajectory of growth. But that's a very different topic than saying that we have a hyperinflation. So that's good news. Thank you very much. Leave a comment below if you agree or disagree. I'd be interested to read it and I will try to teach, take each comment in their components and unwind it. If you can back it up with statistical data or a link, that would be great. If not, make the logical argument and I'll read them. 
Again, thank you very much. Don't forget to subscribe and have a great day. Thank you.